Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another To The Point podcast. Everybody's doing well on this Wednesday, a hump day at that. Um, interesting night in the world of sports. We had some great hockey games, which we're going to touch on. A few including Canadian teams, oddly enough for me. Uh, also, uh, we got some big baseball signings that I did not get to yesterday, including the Toronto Blue Jays locking up you know, a piece they went out and added last year towards a trade deadline. I think that was a really good signing for the Blue Jays. What does it mean the end for Robbie Ray as he hits free agency? Likely. And also, there's a bigger reason why these guys are signing in Major League Baseball early. We're used to not seeing a free agent signing until mid-January, early February. Well, there's always that threat of the lockout, which baseball loves to do. So we'll dive into that whole topic today. And, But last night for me, a lot of good sports on. But the NBA took center stage for me. How I go about watching games is normally I have one on my TV and I have my computer. Sometimes I, I bring out my other, I have my TV from my bedroom and I, a lot of wires. But I can throw two games on my computer with the PIP window. So that helps. But it's last night I'm watching Winnipeg, Edmonton, watching Toronto, Nashville. I'll, but then on the, on the big screen, I, it, was a, it was a basketball night for me. Because it's when you see two great teams, the two best players in the world get to play each other, and it only happens twice a year, you got to tune in. And who I'm talking about, obviously, is Kevin Durant of the Brooklyn Nets and Stephen Curry of, of the Golden State Warriors. And I, I, I'm thinking the start of this game, I think this is an NBA Finals preview, and I still think it, it could be. The Brooklyn Nets have their flaws. That's for sure. They have Kevin Durant, the best player in the world. James Harden has had a slow start. He's always, he's a great player, but would you like him to be in better shape? You bet. Um, Kyrie Irving is still not back, is still not uh, vaccinated. He can't play. There are rumors that the, there's a new mayor in New York. He was elected a month ago uh, in the new year. He may, you know, have new vaccine policies, new protocols, so that Kyrie Irving could potentially return to the Brooklyn Nets before the end of the season. So that could be an interesting twist. But this team was good before. They had a 9-4 and four record coming in. You had the Golden State Warriors at 12-2, and two, uh, playing just fantastic basketball, all, all coming off their second loss of the season Sunday night in Charlotte. And I, I, to, I throw in the game 8-30, like, hey, this is going to be great you know, tight game, the whole, you know, the works. And I leave it going, the Golden State Warriors not only have Stephen Curry, who I think is the second best player in the world right now. Some might say Giannis. You might make the argument LeBron James. Uh, you can throw in whoever you want. To me, it's Steph Curry. He's not only changed the game, but yeah, he's, he's a middle-aged Steph now. He's still that dude. And I think he's more driven than ever to win a title because he's won three. But in the first finals that they won in 2015, Andre Iguodala won finals MVP when he was inserted to the starting lineup after their game three loss. And he guarded LeBron and the rest is history. They win the next three games. Um, and then, then you have, they lose in 2016 after winning 72 games, the best regular season record in the history of pro basketball you know, one upping Michael Jordan's, um, one upping Michael Jordan's great teams that have won. Uh, they went 73, 73 and nine, sorry, where Jordan went 72 and 10. So then the next two years, Kevin Durant departs, comes to Golden State. He wins back to back finals MVPs. He asserts himself as the best player in the world. And Steph Curry's there, a great player, but playing second fiddle when it comes to, Okay, who's the best player on this team? And he never really had a shot at winning finals MVP. But although he's got three titles and he's got two regular season MVPs, the first unanimous MVP in the history of the National Basketball Association, I still think this guy has a chip on his shoulder because he was the guy that was drafted into the NBA from Davidson where they said, this guy can't make it. This guy's going to be too small. He's, he's never going to make it in the NBA. Blake Griffin, now a role player for the Brooklyn Nets, 
went first overall in that draft from the University of Oklahoma. And you look at their careers, it's not even close. Steph Curry is going to go down as one of the top three guards in the history of the sport. I mean, you can make the argument it's Magic Johnson, John Stockton, and then Steph Curry, however you want to do it. But nevertheless, you have two great players. You, and in Golden State, there's no Clay Thompson. He hasn't played in two years after tearing his ACL in, in the finals against the Toronto Raptors and then blowing out his Achilles last year during training camp. No James Wiseman. Last year's second overall pick in the draft. He has not played a game this year. But I left this game going. I knew that Golden State was deep. Obviously, they're winning games. But they won last night. Big. They won by 18, but at the nine-minute mark of the fourth quarter, they were up by 28 points. 106-80, and Kevin Durant, James Harden did not touch the floor again the rest of the game. This game was over, and Steph Curry shot 11 for 16 last night from the field. That's just what he does. Eight for 12 from three-point range. That is just incredible what this guy can do. And not only did I see that from him last night, but his ability to feed guys. He found Draymond Green in the lane, and he's just, he just looks like a complete player. He's beefed up a little bit. He's strong. So you have Steph Curry. But last night, a guy who almost didn't play this year because of the COVID rules, and he's been a major disappointment. Another former first overall pick. Andrew Wiggins dropped 17 last night, but he was efficient. He, he saw it six for 10. You'll take that every day of the week. He had 17 points and he scored, um, scored 13 in the second quarter, including a buzzer beater at the end of the half. This team from three is deadly. Steph Curry was five for seven from three at halftime. But you look at the depth, Jordan Poole had 15 points. Draymond Green had 11 with also eight assists. And it goes on. They have a bench of great players that you shouldn't be afraid to play. Jonathan Kaminga is a high pick they had last year in the draft. He hasn't played a ton of minutes yet for this team. I still think Steve Kerr is learning to trust him. But the Duke can play. You look last night. Damon Lee. Iguodala, Kaminga, Porter Jr., Gary Payton the second. I think this is going to be a great player for this team. But before blowout last night, they had played seven guys off the bench. Seven bench players. This is before the blowout. This was in the first half. Bielisa was playing. Gary Payton uh, the second. Otto, uh, Porter Jr. These guys were all playing. Or you juxtapose that to the Brooklyn Nets in the... They were playing Bembry off the bench and Carter. That was it. They ended up playing Sharp, Edwards, and LaMarcus Aldridge, who's had a strong start to the season. But these guys weren't getting minutes. And I look at this team. Yes, Joe Harris was not available last night. That hurts for sure. But this team just doesn't have a whole lot of depth. I mentioned Kevin Durant. I have so much faith in Kevin Durant. But last night he shot six for 19. That's not good. Uh, James Harden shot six for 13 and turned the ball over five times. You're going to lose a lot of games doing that. But you look at the rest of the team. Okay, Bruce Brown at 14, zero points in the second half. Blake Griffin had four. Patty Mills only with eight. And I just look at this team. They don't have the depth. They don't. Like Brooklyn has a better player, in my opinion, Kevin Durant, than LeBron James right now. And the Lakers have their issues. They're eight and seven where, you know, Brooklyn is 10 and five. You know, I'm not saying there's a panic button here, but there's a difference between evaluating the Detroit Pistons, the Chicago Bulls, then there is the Brooklyn Nets, then there is Golden State, then there's the Lakers right now. I look at Brooklyn and say, okay, you have the best player in the world. You have one of James Harden's another guy. He's the top five player in the world, you could argue. The Lakers, LeBron. Okay, check. You also got Russell Westbrook. He's got his flaws, but you know where he is. He's, he's going to be a Hall of Famer. So it all looks well and good on, on paper. But when you get to the surface, you go, well, we turn the ball over too much. We're inconsistent from shooting threes. Rondo's not a good three-point shooter. Um, LeBron's not a good three-point shooter. Russell Westbrook shoots 29%. 
and we're relying on our bench to really score us points. Well, okay, that's a problem. The, the only way it's a positive season this season for teams like the Lakers, for teams like Golden State, for teams like Brooklyn, in my opinion, is a championship. It's championship or bust. It's not, well, it's a good story. We made it to the second round. That's the Chicago Bulls, a team that's on the come up, that put a team together, you know, oddly enough, through free agency. The Bulls were built through trades and free agency. They've tried the draft. They haven't hit. The draft picks like Kobe White, like Laurie Markinen, are gone. They're not on the team anymore. What do they do? Trade deadline, they go get Nikola Vucevic, a guy who's a perennial all-star to play center. Then in the offseason, they go and sign DeMar DeRozan, the former great Toronto Raptor who spent the last number of years in San Antonio playing for Greg Popovich. Okay, good signing. You know what he is. He's very consistent. Can't shoot the three worth a lick, but his 18-foot jumper, that's his game, and you know he's a great teammate. Okay, then you go get Lonzo Ball, who was the former number two overall pick to the Los Angeles Lakers. The guy Magic Johnson once said would have his number hung in the rafters, which was a really dumb decision at the time, uh, saying that just as the kid was drafted, but he's gone through his growing pains, had tough times with the Lakers, went to New Orleans, wasn't exactly a great cup of tea there playing for Stan Van Gundy. But what has he done? He's shooting over 40% from three-point range. The guy who used to shoot from the top shelf is no longer shooting bricks. The guy plays, he's six in defensive win shares in the NBA, and he shot seven for 10 from three on Sunday night against the Lakers. He's improving. He's still a great passer. And you also add... You had Zach Levine, who you got from the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves, in a trade for Jimmy Butler. Every great player they have on their roster, they've added through trades. This team, it's so counterproductive and counterintuitive to how we normally see teams built. (laughs) It's not about, oh, well, yeah, we drafted really well. No, the Bulls are 10 and four, and they're 10 and four. Because of guys that they've added, like I just said, this way, a different way. I mean, they beat they beat the Lakers on Monday. They crushed them. And but long story short, the NBA is full of some really great teams. And then there's some really good stories to start the year. One of them being the Chicago Bulls. The other, another being the Washington Wizards, who are 10 and three, you know, oddly enough, 10 and three, and they traded away Russell Westbrook, their supposed best player. And he's on an eight and seven Lakers team that's barely hanging on to a playoff spot at this point. You know, another good story the Cleveland Cavaliers, nine and six. Will these stories continue? Who's to say? I mean, Cleveland's got the, the Nets tonight. I mean, that's a tough matchup, but another good story for them. Um, you know, Toronto with Scotty Barnes has been a positive story. He's the fourth overall pick has outplayed, (coughs) excuse me, Jalen Suggs for Orlando. He's just played better than him. Plus Orlando is a team that's struggling. They, um, they are three and 11, one of the worst teams in, in basketball, the third worst team behind Houston, who only has one win in new Orleans, who only has a pair. So, that's just some of what's going on here in the NBA. Good, there's good story. You know, the West is loaded. And I look at a team like Golden State. You got Phoenix, who's 10 and 3, a team that went to the finals last year. Really good. Dallas is 9 and 4. I have my druthers about Dallas. I do think they'll make the playoffs. Me and Harrison Schutenbelt argued about this. But, you know, they have Luka Doncic. And after that, it gets thin. I, I like Tim Hardaway, but nevertheless, Utah. I think Utah could win a title this year. That's how bullish I am on Utah. Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert. They just, they've had a team together for a long time. They know how each other play. Denver, same thing. If Jamal Murray can come back, look out. Because they have Jokic, who's the reigning M- uh, NBA MVP. Aaron Gordon plays well. So who knows? Michael Porter Jr. is also a good player. Then you have the two LA teams. Memphis is hanging around. Portland. It The top end's loaded in the West. When you get past... 
when you get past Portland in the ninth seed, Sacramento, OKC, Minnesota, San Antonio, New Orleans, those teams are all no good. But I look at the style of basketball, and it's it's very, very impressive to me how, how Golden State went from a track team of two shooters, and that's how you're going to win games with Draymond getting hustle points, him grabbing rebounds, being a strong defender. But now we've seen them beat the Lakers this year. They can play a game where, yeah, they're still going to be great at shooting threes, but last night they were getting into the paint. They're making it difficult on Brooklyn. Neither, neither of these teams is going to be great in the paint because they don't have a traditional <coughs> excuse me, big on their roster. But Kaminga, Igadala. Is a still is a crafty veteran who will get to the paint. He'll shoot his shot. He knows his strengths and weaknesses at this point of his career, and they just find ways to be successful. And you know, kudos to to Golden State. I would say to Brooklyn, if you're going to win a championship this year, you're gonna have to have more depth. Maybe that's Kyrie coming back, but again, when does he come back? They have enough reps to play with each other to feel confident that you could go on a deep run. There's obviously that issue. And I guess you'd look, if you're Brooklyn, you say, well, we could get to the finals because we play in the Eastern Conference. Okay, I you know normally I'd agree with that, but this East is not what it used to be. It's not the cakewalk. Um, Miami's a strong team. These are realistic teams in the East that I think could cause some problems. Milwaukee's six and eight, but I expect them to turn it around. They've been struggling they got the Lakers tonight. Big primetime game on ESPN. Both those teams need it, but Milwaukee needs to turn around. Atlanta is a playoff team. They're six and nine. Can they? They got the Celtics tonight. Another big game for them. They try to right the ship. Philadelphia. They're eight and seven, but they haven't had Matias Thibault. They haven't had Joel Embiid. They haven't Ben Simmons all year. I think they get healthy. They can push for a top spot in the East. Um, Chicago and, and Washington are just so unknown because you don't know. They're young. They don't have a whole lot of experience when it comes to these big moments. Bradley Beal is a great player, but Kyle Kuzma, uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, uh, Caldwell Pope, can these guys be consistent enough all year to potentially make the playoffs? That'd be a great story if the Wizards and the Bulls both made it. Teams that didn't make it last year. The Wizards are at the Hornets tonight. Sneaky good game. I mentioned at the Bulls are in Portland as they're still on a, a lengthy road trip that's been so successful so far. The Bulls beat the they beat the uh, sorry the Clippers and the Lakers in back to back games on the weekend. They they're just playing really great basketball. They're fun to watch. They play with a chip on their shoulder. They're, they're not afraid of anybody. They'll go up against anybody, and that's something you got to appreciate about this team that they they just come at you and they they'll take it on the chin when you want to give it to them. But the NBA is off to a great start. I thought last night, you know, Steph Curry really, he showed why he's still one of the best players in the world, why he revolutionized the game. And he continues to do so because Kevin Durant didn't have, didn't have his best night. But even not having his best night, you're expecting some people to step up. You didn't see it from Brooklyn. They didn't have anybody step up, step up to keep this game close. And they were at home. They were down 28 at home in the fourth quarter. and. You know, Kyrie Irving still counts against the cap. So it's not like you can just bring in a contract of his size with him out with COVID. So do you move him? I think that's something you have to consider because if he can't play for your team, then he's just sitting there. He's John Wall in Washington, in Houston. Right now, the Houston Rockets, the worst team in the NBA, uh, worst team in the NBA, they are, they're paying him over $40 million. He has not played a single dribble this season. He's healthy. However, you know, they want their young players to play. They drafted Jalen Green second overall. He's a guard. They want the youth movement, and I'm sure they'd love another top two pick in next year's draft where they're hoping this year's NCAA crop can be very successful. They can get another good player and start building towards the future after James Harden departed. Where John Wall is injury prone, you know what he is, and he's not going to you know, get accept the buyout because he's owed $47 million next year. So you could have this on your books for another year and a half with him just sitting there being hopefully a good teammate to these youngsters as they break into the league. 
But that's basically what Kyrie Irving is. He's not around the team. He's at home. Do you look for a move? I think another, uh, another, you know, James Harden can be the point guard of this team, but another shooter would be really nice because Kyrie Irving, you know, he is, he's listed as a point guard, but he's more of a two because he's never been a pass first player. He's always going to take that shot when he feels it, he shoots it. That's just, that's his instinct as a player. That's how he goes about his business. And I, I heard a proposal today, potentially Kyrie Irving for Ben Simmons. That's interesting. Um, I don't think it's a terrible idea because Ben Simmons can bring the ball up the floor. He can defend, which is something that Brooklyn just does not do. Ben Simmons could play power forward, stay in the paint, be really good defensively, assist the basketball, and guard your best player. That's something that would really help Brooklyn. Philadelphia, well, Simmons and Embiid are not playing again. That's just a fact. Simmons would be able to play in Philadelphia because they don't have that COVID policy in place. But, you know, Irving, Irving and Embiid, I mean, they, Embiid's, I think they both would have really big egos. Embiid's going to need his touches. He nearly won the MVP last year, but, you know, Kyrie's going to come in as the NBA champion. But who knows the way it's been going, he might just say he's going to retire if he's moved anywhere that's not Brooklyn. So still a lot to be decided. And, you know, you look beginning of the year and be like, well, we could go get John, uh, Bradley Beal from Washington. We can make a move. Well, maybe not if they're winning because the Washington Wizards have not been winning in a long period of time. And for fans to show up in that building, I don't think ownership's going to want to do that, especially following a pandemic where money was lost in the billions for every sports league. And you're going to want to recoup that as much as you can. And having a full building in late March is, I'm sure, something that Ted Leonsis, the owner of the uh, Washington Capitals and Washington Wizards, would love to see in 2022 so uh real interesting uh nba game last night and lots to, to dive into as we move forward um i mentioned last night you know the nhl lots of good action um you, you see a lot of in- interesting storylines that can be taken from those games last night um for me I, I look at a team that is struggling mightily and you know, it, it's shocking, but also, you know, this team's been really successful for the past couple of years, and you run into injuries, and you go through tough things, and to me, the biggest disappointment so far this season has got to be the New York Islanders. This team has been to back-to-back conference finals, and yes, they started the season 13 straight on the road. That is so difficult. That is not an easy task, but to have 12 points is just not acceptable. I, I, I look at this team and say, where are you? You know, New York has played 13 games, 12 points. They are behind Pittsburgh in the standings. They are behind Columbus, New Jersey. They, they just haven't found their game. And it was just announced before we went live that Ryan Pollock, you could argue their best defenseman, is out four to six weeks. So it just continues to get worse. But... This team does not play well defensively, which is what they're known for. They're not getting big saves from Simeon Varlamov or Ilya Sorokin. They're not scoring timely goals. I mean, I, just looking at this team, yes, Brock Nelson, he had a, a four-goal game, but he's got seven on the year, so he's got three in the rest of his games. Josh Bailey's been banged up. That's a key loss. But looking throughout their lineup, Barzell has eight points in 13 games. Not good enough, and he's Turn uh, Bouvillier, 7 and 13. Again, not good enough. You need to see more from this guy. Sezikis, 1 and 12. He's a fourth line center. But again, Cal Clutterbuck, this fourth line the other night, the best fourth line in hockey was a dash four. They were beat up against this team. Brock Nelson's got nine points in 13. That's good, you know, but you, you could hope for more. Pajot's got four and 12. That Pajot's a really important player on this team. He can't be that inefficient. Paul Mary, who was a great deadline acquisition, they re-signed. He's got one goal in 13 games. I mean, come on. That is just not good enough. You need something more. You need Mayfield's got one point in 13 games. This team is not built on guys getting 100 points. That's the way Barry Trotz allows his teams to play. But for them to be so unorganized, to be so 
out of position. For defensemen like Scott Mayfield, like Ryan Pollock, to look average, to look below average, just to be to be burnt on several plays is just alarming to me. I mean, I, you know, Chara and Aho, but Dobson's been in the doghouse. He, he's been, he was a healthy scratch on Monday night. Andy Green's a veteran, but he hasn't exactly worked out this year. So there's time to turn it around, but you look at it and the Islanders are, as we currently stand, 11 points out of third in the Metropolitan. And they would be oh, seven, there's seven points out of a playoff spot. That is a very difficult position to be in this early. You have to make up so much ground. And yes, you're, you're finally going home. You're opening up a new rink, but it's with a sour taste in your mouth because at the end of this 13 game road trip, they lose to Florida 6 1. They lost to Tampa, uh, Tampa Monday night which wasn't close as well. And it just seems like it's a point night. Sorokin, four goals allowed on on 17 shots. That's not good enough. You need consistent goaltending. And normally they get it. Sorokin or Varlamov, this team just plays well. But they haven't seen it this year. And you look, it was just everybody wanted a goal. Frank Petrano had a goal last night. You had Ekblad on the board. Hornquist, Carter Verhege, Ryan Lomberg. Every guy that was on a had a slump scored a goal last night, and for the Islanders, who I pegged as a a really a lock team to make the playoffs out of this division, it's shocking to me because you look at it now. Carolina's been the most. I think you could argue Carolina's been the most consistent team in the NHL this year, even more than Florida, whom I love. But Carolina is twelve and two. They get a, a win in Vegas last night with Auntie Ranta returning from from an injury, so they're. They're as good as, as it gets right now. You look at their systems, Rob Brendamore coaching that team. The back end is really what's special to me, how they break pucks out of the zone, how they use their defensemen offensively when it comes to creating opportunity is exactly, you know, every, every uh, parent that has a defenseman for a, uh, that has a daughter or son playing, you want Rob Brendamore to be your coach because they value the point. They use it. It's not just a decoy. When on the power play, I'm fine if, if the defenseman's a decoy because they're not that creative. In Carolina, they use them effectively, and they're a huge part of their offense. Washington. I think Washington will make the playoffs. I, I still have my issues with them. I don't think they're a Stanley Cup contender. They've lost five games in overtime this year. You know, you get a couple good breaks, you're in a way better position. I mean, they lose another overtime game last night where they – in Anaheim, Anaheim wins their eight straight. I mean, that's just crazy to me that, you know, this uh, Anaheim team continues to roll. But Washington's lost five games in overtime or a shootout. That's tough. But, you know, they have Ovechkin, Kuznetsov's had a great start. I think this, with this division, the way it's stacking up, I like Washington to, to make the playoffs. The Rangers, another team I expect a lot from. They're 10 3 and 3. They get a win in Montreal last night. But you look at this team, they got some grit. They got it in the offseason. They got a guy like Ryan Reeves. Capo Caco, who's having a slow start. I still think he's a really good player. He, he's he got a, some edge to him. He seems pissed off. I like the way he goes. They have Panarin. You know, Chris Kreider's got 12 goals, which is tied for second in the NHL with Alex Ovechkin. So when he's going, you got to love that. And Igor Shesterkin is the real deal. I mean, last night uh, he had 33 shots, 31 saves against, you know, Montreal. But it is what it is. But for, for this team in New York, you're playing well. you got to hope that Lafreniere can continue to grow Kako. Lafreniere's only got five points on the season. He had a hot start. He's gone quiet. Kako's got three and 12, so neither of their top picks has been fantastic. But Keandre Miller is getting better for me. That's a positive. Strom is, is off to a good start this year. Truba uh, is a guy that you can feel confident in. Sabinajad's only got four goals, but he does have 14 points. So... Those three, and then, so I would, I would expect those three, but then you have Philly, New Jersey, Columbus, Pittsburgh, and New York. I think all those teams could push for the playoffs, but it's not an easy division. Columbus is not a pushover anymore. Pittsburgh, I expect to fall off, because, even though they are just a perennial playoff team. That's what they do. They make the playoffs year in, year out. But they're getting older. 
I don't trust their goaltending. Their back end has always been a weak part of their team, but it only gets weaker by the year. And I think we'll see Pittsburgh finally take a step back and miss the playoffs after this lengthy period of time. But it's certainly, you know, it's disappointing for the Islanders. And the only team that I could, I have no, I had no um, expectations for this team before the year, but the Arizona Coyotes, for context, last night was November 16th. So half, halfway through the month of November, the Arizona Coyotes won their second game. They beat St. Louis last. I don't, it, for St. Louis, it's got to be embarrassing to lose to this team. Like, Craig Rube must just turn on film and say, what the hell happened? Like, I don't care. You lose to Arizona. It's embarrassing. Like, their only win was against the expansion team in Seattle. Not anymore. You can point to St. Louis. And it's honestly, it's a running joke now for me because they, they're just so bad. And this is kind of my truth in the, you know, this is my test. Jacob Chikrin was on the radar to make Team Canada after last season. A guy they really liked said a young player, great shot. He could play on that power play, dynamic player. So far this year, and plus minus is not everything. Believe me, when you're like a minus three in the year, I give you that. But, and just for instance, just for clarification, last year he had 41 points in 56 games, 18 goals, and he was a minus six. So the old dinosaurs would say, oh, well, you'd have a great year. minus six. Okay. But He's still a really good season. He's a guy that, that was on the short list. Well, he's off that short list this year because I think his confidence shot because Arizona has no one to play with. He has two points in 16 games, and he's a minus 24. I Minus 24, a guy that was at the top of his game last year that looked like a stud, a future breakout guy. And it's only going to get worse because Shane Goss's bear is playing the best for, for Arizona. He was a guy that was put on, uh, traded for basically cap space. He, this team, Phil, this team, all they have going for it is Phil Castle chasing a record for most for the Ironman streak. But I wanted to look up the worst starts in the history of the NHL because I thought this was, this was funny. Um, you know, the Coyotes are, are so pathetic. Um, you know, without they, it's just we look at 1980-81. These are some of the worst starts. The Winnipeg Jets were one fourteen and five. They were an expansion team, but that's pathetic. Toronto Maple Leafs nineteen ninety nine ninety one three sixteen and one. So Arizona could join that level. San Jose Sharks three sixteen and one. Washington back to back years were two sixteen and two in nineteen seventy four seventy five. 1997-98 Tampa Bay 216 and 2 expansion team. New Jersey Devils 93-84-2 and 18. Oof. And then 92-93, the worst ever were the Ottawa Senators at 118 and 1. One win over the first 20 games. So as pathetic as, but I, I just look at Arizona and I I just don't see anything that you'd want to go see. Again, you have Phil Kessel. Great. You know, he's chasing that record, but okay. Liam O'Brien. Good guy, undrafted, good story, but is he a great player? No. Barrett Hayton scores his first two goals of the season last night. Bully for him was the captain at the World Juniors. Galchenyuk is on this team. Louis Erickson, my God. Um, Lawson Krause is one of the better forwards. He's a power guy. He was a guy that you know, when he was uh, a few years after the draft, like, well, where's the offense from Lee, uh, from uh, Lawson Krause? Well, he's now the offensive juggernaut on this team. That just tells you how big of a rabbit hole this team's down and they don't know where they're going to be playing next year because they're, they're getting kicked out of their building. And they had a GM who had uh, draft picks taken from them because he's a cheat. I mean, it, it's just a mess in Arizona and I feel bad for the few kids they have like Peyton Keller, like Jacob Chikrin, who genuinely are real, are good NHL players that, you know, you could move and be in good situations, but unfortunately for them, they're in a really bad one right now and they're gonna have to battle through it. And it'll tell, it'll tell me a lot about them as people and as players. If they can come out the other side of this terrible, terrible experience and an experiment, if you will, and show people that they have the result, they have the, the oomph, the fervor to, to play well and, and ultimately be a good NHL and a good pro for many years to come. Um, also last night, 
you know, a couple, couple, like I said, I was watching t- primarily two games in, in the NHL. I was watching Oilers, Jets, and then Leafs, Preds in the early state of games. Uh, I did watch a lot of that uh, Washington, Anaheim as well, which I'll, I'll touch on in a second. But um, the Winnipeg Jets are coming on. They are really starting to play. I mentioned yesterday that I thought that I think, you know, I know they're the best team in Canada. And I'm sure Leafs fans are probably yelling at me through the screen right now. But I don't care because I watch the games and I know what I see. Um, The Winnipeg Jets have always had a flaw, in my opinion, where they had really good players like Blake Wheeler, like Mark Shifley, like Connor Hellebuck. But to me, their biggest flaw was the back end. Where in years past, they'd have guys that were put in positions that they just weren't comfortable with. Tucker Pullman playing too high in the lineup. Um, Tyler Myers playing too high in the lineup. Dustin Bufflin being out of shape playing. It was just a weakness that eventually caught up with them. And I credit Kevin Cheveldayoff, who's been through a lot lately with the whole Chicago, Chicago incident. And whether you agree that he's on the job or not, it's not really the top of my topic of conversation here. But in the offseason, they go out and add Brendan Dillon, a veteran who's played in the playoffs, hard-nosed, knows how to do it, just a reliable guy. They also had Nate Schmidt, a guy who's been to a Stanley Cup final, been in a, a Vegas environment where an expansion team where they had little to no expectations. But what has Nate Schmidt done? He started playing with Josh Morrissey, and Josh Morrissey is playing like a rejuvenated guy. Josh Morrissey, in my opinion, is playing at such a high level that he's getting put back in the Team Canada Olympic discussion. He's playing at that high of a level. He's playing super smart. Neil Pionk has always been my favorite player, a uh, favorite defenseman on this team, but he hasn't played his best this year. But you look, Stanley, Schmidt, Pionk, Morrissey, Dylan, and Dylan DeMello is another guy that doesn't get enough love. This guy's a defensive defenseman from Ottawa, uh, formerly of the San Jose Sharks, but he just does his job really well. He knows where to be, what position to be in, and they have guys that are game breakers. Kyle Connor just scores goals. He's got 12 on the year in 15 games. He's an elite player. He's got 20 points in 15 games. I couldn't think high, uh, more highly of him. Andrew Kopp is a guy that just works his tail off, and he gets rewarded for it. You know, Last year, I saw him as the best. Uh, he was playing with Adam Lowry. They're on the best third line in hockey. He's been elevated. He's playing a top six role, and you have to. He's playing with the likes of Connor and these guys because not only is he a hard worker, which he is, but he's creative with the puck. He's got 16 points in 15 games. Over a point per game for Andrew Kopp. I always thought he had more. He continues to deliver. Again, another uh, a goal last night for this guy, but... Uh, just a fantastic start to the season. Pierre-Luc Dubois is, you know, I think he took last year on the chin. He had a really tough year. He stunk it up in the playoffs. Well, you look this year, he's playing rejuvenated. He was a former third overall pick, and he's playing like it. He looks, he's a centerman that could be a number one. Because Shifley's been out for most of the year. And when he has played, he's been inconsistent. So he looks great. Shifley got on the board last night. He gets a goal. So I mentioned Sveshnikov. I really like the way he plays with those two guys. Blake Wheeler's had a slow start, hasn't scored a goal yet, but this team is coming into form. Connor Hellebuck is one of the best goalies in the NHL. You can rely on him day in, day out. And they it's not like they played a, a slump team last. They played the Edmonton Oilers, and after two periods, it was 4 nothing. Yet Adam Lowry scored a really weak goal of Miko Koskinen where he shot the puck from about the hash marks, goes under his arm and through him. Ehlers then scored. You had Pierre-Luc Dubois on the power play, and then Mark, uh, Mark Shifley also scored. See so a balance. And for Edmonton, of course, Dreisaitl and McDavid, they put up two power play goals. That's just what they do early in the third period. Dreisaitl potting both of them. He now has uh, 17 goals on the season. That's five more than the next closest player. And I looked at the Jets compared to the Oilers last night. Uh, the Jets have quicker transi- quicker transition game, their zone exits, and the forwards help the breakouts. They come deep into the zone. They really make it a point of emphasis for this team to be really, really efficient. And I think you see times where the, where the Oilers hang out too close by 
the blue line where you have guys just kind of hang out. They do their little, little curl and head out. And it's sometimes the pass isn't there or the defenseman is gapped up because they're predictable. But, you know, this isn't, oh, the sky's falling at Edmonton. Like I said yesterday, I expect Calgary to take a step back. They lost to Philly last night. A really cool moment for Kevin Hayes as he scored his first goal of the season. Points up to the sky, uh, you know, meaning that he's, you know, thinking about his younger brother, or sorry, his older brother, Jimmy, who um, passed away from a fentanyl, um, cocaine mixed with fentanyl overdose uh, early in this off season. So that, that was a cool moment, but you just look at this team and say, Edmonton's better than what they were. I have more faith in them. Calgary loses another game to Philly. They can't score goals anymore. And I'm like, okay, this is what I, I thought from this team. I meant to still playing at that high level where they don't quit. You see McDavid dry. So they're back checking more. They're trying to make a concerted effort to be involved in the other end of the ice. And that's how you're going to win games. That was John Tortorella's point last week. So good, good, you know, bully for the Jets. I think they're, they're, the best team in Canada. I like the way they play. I think their defense is not fast by any means, but what did we see from the Montreal Canadiens when they got to, to, to the Stanley Cup playoffs? They had a big defense in Sherratt, in Weber. Petrie is not big physically, but he's, he's big. You know, he's, he's a big man. Romanoff is not big in stature, but when it comes to his girth, he is. They had a big, slower defenseman, you know, defense core. You get to the playoffs where the ice is cut off. That's exactly what you want. Dylan's a better skater than he used to be. He's really worked on that. Schmidt does skate well, but he's again, he's a heavier type defenseman. You have a bunch of guys that are not afraid to mix it up. Josh Morrissey has some bite. He can take some stupid penalties, but he's not going to be pushed around. He's not going to be uh, made look like a Pepsi out there. You got um, Logan Stanley, six foot seven. Uh, he, he skates well for that, for, for that big of a man. And you got to be impressed with just the way he plays a lot of the time. Nate, again, I mentioned Nate Smith, Dylan. They're not going to take that shit. DeMello, he's another guy. He's a fifth, sixth defenseman. But you've been in the league long enough. You're proud. He's played in San Jose where he's, he's been into a Stanley Cup final in 2016. He knows what it takes to get there. These guys are battle-tested. DeMello, Schmidt, Brendan Dillon have all played in a Stanley Cup final. That's a luxury to have on your back end to know to be in those playoff type situations and have guys not freak out. Just oppose that to Edmonton. Duncan Key's been there, done that, of course. But Darnell Nurse, uh, Clefbaum, uh, Bouchard, these guys don't have that experience. And that's something that I think could hurt them. But you know, they meet up again on Thursday. That you know, it's an interesting matchup because. I really like the way the Jets play. They're starting to come out of their shell. Shifley and Wheeler haven't even played well yet this year. That's a positive sign for me that this team is winning games where you can argue their two most important players over the last five to 10 years has just been fared okay. They've been there, but haven't exactly done that and haven't actually been a factor for a lengthy period of time. Also last night, the Toronto Maple Leafs beat the Nashville Predators. Three to nothing. Uh, prior to the game, they welcomed and celebrated the retirement of former uh, captain for five plus years, Dion Phaneuf. Um, I thought this was a good move uh, by the Leafs. You know, he's a captain for five years. Whether you like him or not, I think it's irrelevant. Um, personal story. Back in the day, my father used to do insurance for a living, and he sold insurance to Paul Phaneuf, who was Dion's father. And then my dad uh, eventually handled Dion's, uh, Dion's insurance as well. So at the time, Paul, really nice guy. Uh, so was Dion. And Dion, you know, just having that connection, offered to get us tickets to a game. And also we'd be able to go to a morning skate and then get to get a tour of the Toronto Maple Leafs locker room. And I was a little kid at the time, incredible, such a generous guy, Dion, really down to earth. I had met him and his now wife, Alicia Cuthbert, at a uh, special needs auction, a special Olympics auction in PEI. And she was very nice. She let me talk to her about 24, uh, which is, if you don't know, it's a show with Kiefer Sutherland. Uh, it's 
I, I recommend it, but she was very nice. She let me be nerd out and talk about Jack Bauer and Audrey Reigns and all those great uh, fictional characters from that show. But anyway, um, we go to the game. We go to the morning skate, which uh, is such a cool thing if you can go. Uh, you get to see both teams out there. Uh, Sydney Crosby actually was out there. They were playing the Penguins. Crosby was out there for the morning skate. You got to see all the Leafs come out of uh, all the players that were there from the morning skate actually signed a jersey that I still have. And the signature that I hold most dear to my heart is from Leo Komarov, who is still, uh, you know, still one of my favorites. He uh, recently, him and the Islanders decided to part ways. He's playing again in CSK Moscow in the KHL. But nevertheless, we got to go to the morning skate. We got a tour of the least dressing room. You should have seen all the skates. The, I mean, it's top notch. There's a first class kitchen in there. The stalls are absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it, you know, you play in Toronto, you get you get uh, treated extremely well. But that never would have happened. I never would have had that experience to see that locker room to meet a few of the players. Um, after the game, we got to stand outside the door. And I got to meet Nick Kiprios, uh, which was cool. He's a guy I really look up to. Um, and I think he, he was a really good media personality and uh, wrote a great book as well uh, last year. But that's my that's my personal story from Dion Phaneuf. I, I was a kid. I didn't get to have an, an adult conversation with the man. But he clearly has a big heart. I think you could tell that. I listened to his interview um, on Overdrive from yesterday's show uh, earlier today. And, you know, he talked about this incident in Toronto where it was called, it's known as Salute Gate, where one night the, the Toronto Maple Leafs lost to Nashville 9-2. to two. And, you know, tr- there's some Toronto Maple Leafs fans who are just classless, uh, like every fan base. But it's hard to play in markets like Toronto, like Montreal, when you're losing. People are throwing jerseys on the ice, throwing waffles. Um, I think, you know, throwing a jersey – Doing that, you know, de- defacing what you what you value, is really shameful. And that next game, the least won, and they didn't salute the fans. Now, I think this was blown way out of proportion, because who says you have to salute the fans? Uh, fans in Toronto primarily are quiet. You go to a game there, it's like going to a library. So I don't think they deserve the recognition, quite frankly because it's not loud. Uh, you go to the Bell Center, you hear them positive or negatively. It's, a, it's an experience that you want to at least do once in your life. Even if you're a Leaf fan, I remember when I was a kid, when I was a Leaf fan, I went to a game in Montreal. I wore my Leaf jersey. If, I, if, I did that, if somebody did that now, yeah, you'd be a little bit worried, but guess what? It's part of the experience. And you go to the Bell Center, it's, it's an atmosphere. I, I want to check out all the rinks to compare, but Toronto's not, it's more of a museum than it is a, you know, a Woodstock. And, but that, they didn't salute them. Dion took the brunt of that because he was the captain. But again, why you threw jerseys on the ice, you turned your back on us. Why should we salute you for, for nothing? And again, this is probably, this is a, a big deep dive and a big conversation but I never was a fan of, uh, I was fine with what, what the least players did. I actually like it because if you listen to me on this podcast, I am anti-establishment. I am anti, you know, I, I, when people do something that you're not technically supposed to do, I'm all for that just because I'm a shit disturber. So um, I'm off, but th- uh, Dion thousand games in the NHL, um, you know, doing that for my family. I really appreciate it. I just wanted to share with you guys kind of my personal tale from dealing with Dion and also also got to see his place in, in PEI, uh, his cottage over there as well. So that was really cool um, as well. So really, really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed that. And great career. You know, uh, won, a, won a world junior uh, in 2005 and arguably one of the best teams in the history of that tournament. Uh, went the 04 draft class is, you could make the argument, it's the best draft class of all time. Look up, Go look up the 2004 NHL draft. And you know, I'll do it for you right now because it, it's what this draft brought the NHL is really incredible. Um, this is just this is just incredible. First pick in the draft was Alex Ovechkin. Yeah, uh, 
best goal scorer of all time, Stanley Cup champion, eight, Rocket Richards. Okay. Two, Evgeny Malkin. Do you think he goes second overall? Uh, incredible. Andrew Ladd. Okay. Yeah, you might say, oh, Andrew Ladd's not that good of a player. Well, he's won a Stanley Cup, and he's been a great player in the league. Blake Wheeler, fifth. Um, maybe this is not the draft I'm thinking of. I was thinking of uh, – I must have got the years wrong. I'm thinking of Dion Phaneuf. He might have went in 05. Or did he, oh, so I'm sorry. It's 2003. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, 2003 is when he went because he played in the 04 World. Yes, that's how it works. 04 World Junior. Yes, here we go. So 2003, Mark andre Fleury, number one, Hall of Famer. Eric Stahl, number two to Carolina, Hall of Famer. Then you had Nathan Horton. Well, injuries – Cost him his career, but he also won a Stanley Cup. Nikolai Zherdev, who I talked to with Doug McLean about, uh, if you remember that interview, he had all the talent in the world, just couldn't make it work. Thomas Vanek, good player, was in the NHL. Ryan Suter, still playing. Dion Phaneuf. 11, Jeff Carter. 13, Los Angeles, Dustin Brown, still there. Two-time Stanley Cup champion. 14, Chicago, Brent Seabrook, three-time Stanley Cup champion. 17, to New Jersey, Zach Parisi. Anaheim, 19th pick, Ryan Getzlaff. Okay, maybe going to the Hall of Fame, maybe a Stanley Cup champion. 20, Brent Burns, pretty good player. 23, Vancouver, Ryan Kessler. 24 to Philadelphia, Mike Richards. 26 to Los Angeles, Brian Boyle. 28th to Anaheim, Corey Perry. I mean, the list goes on. Louis Erickson went in the second round. He's a shelf himself now, but great player. Uh, you have... Patrice Bergeron went 45th to Boston. Still there. Shea Weber, 49 to Nashville. Oh, Jesus. Corey Crawford, 52 to Chicago. Uh, David Backus, 62 to St. Louis. Uh, captain of a Stanley Cup winning team. Uh, he, he had a great career uh, and uh, won you know great career there. But just going through it, I mean, these names, there's, there's hockey Hall of Famers here. Uh, these, these aren't just average players. These guys are all elite, elite talents. Nigel Dawes, funny enough, Nigel Dawes went uh, 149 in the fifth round in, to the Rangers. Didn't have a great NHL career. He's actually one of the most accomplished players in the history of the KHL. He's a god over there. So for different reasons, he's absolutely uh, looked at. Mark Mathot went in the sixth round. He had a very good NHL career, a real, sol- real solid player, his whole career there. Um, I feel like there was a, a great player. Joe Pavelski, seventh. I knew there was a guy in the seventh. Joe, little Joe, seventh rounder, perennial good goal scorer, uh, captain for San Jose, great career for, for little Joe. Um, and and the, the rounds go on. Uh, Matt Molson played a long time in the, in the NHL. Uh, but, you know, that's just the 03 draft that he was a part of. And again, the world junior team that he ended up winning gold that just dominated that tournament. He had the double D on moment where Pierre Maguire talked about him, you know, hitting two players at once. So congrats to him. But looking at the game last night, Lee's Preds. Um, Lee's won the game 3 0. Uh, it could have been 5 6 0. The Preds chased the game the whole time. They, they, didn't, have, they didn't have any control of the puck. They didn't control the tenor of the game. They were just, they were happy that they were there because Toronto had the puck. They cycled it. They had control and Nashville just couldn't do anything with it. The best offensive scoring chances Nashville had last night was when Philip Tomasino was stretched out of the, out of the box. Uh, He was robbed by Jack Campbell at at the end of the first period or at the end of the second period where Toronto had a, a breakdown in their defensive coverage. Nobody was preparing for him coming out of the box and Jack Campbell makes the save. But other than that, I mean, it was a great night from Austin Matthews. He he scores a goal, uh, could have scored four, like I said, but UC Saros just was out of his mind last night, robbing Matthews time after time. It was nice, you know, good song by Cindy Lauper. Uh, It was good to see these two kind of had a a running joke the whole night where they, where they just, you know, Matthews kind of smiled at him saying like, can you not give me one? And, you know, to Saros' credit, he let in that first shot on the power play. After that, he basically said, yeah, screw you, Austin. You're not beating me tonight. But you're starting to see the Leafs depth chip in. Camp, Kasha had gone on a run. 
Uh, Richie fought last night, and I actually thought he played an inspired game last night. That was good to see from him that he cared, that you saw some some fervor, some energy. I think he's been really lifeless over the <coughs> excuse me over the first you know almost twenty games of the season where he's just been there. He's just been moving around the ice. He doesn't play with a physicality that he should, that he should be a guy that go gets the puck. He's 6'3", 6'4", 235 pounds. He's a big man. Not easy guy to move, but too often he's just there. He's just a guy that's on the ice and you don't see him make an impact. So you're off to just like, well, there's Nick, there's Nick Ritchie. So, yeah, I thought 34 was all over the ice. Um, um you know, the, the power play is finally clicking as well. And really, the thing now is they're power play scoring, but you need to see guys like Matthews, Martin, or Nylander score five on five. I mean, Matthews has four of his seven goals this year on the power play. Five on five, he's not having the scoring opportunities. He's normally a great five on five goal scorer, but I will say their power play has great movement. You're seeing, and they're finally setting up plays for their shooters. The power play should run through Matthews or Nylander getting opportunities. Not Marner. He does not have a great wrist shot, and neither does Morgan Riley. If I'm a defender, I will take Morgan Riley all day, all, all day, every day. Shoot the puck because I don't want those other guys shooting it. Morgan Riley fired at me if I'm a goaltender. Take, you'll take your chances. It's like giving Russell Westbrook a, a three-point shot if, if it's Marner or Riley. You give Russ, you say, okay, collapse to the paint. Give him it. Dare him to shoot it. Again, the same thing for Toronto. To not have Matthew shoot it, to not have Bill Nylander shoot it, absolutely. <coughs> You'll take a John Carlson slap shot over Alex Ovechkin all day. It's the same situation here. But to the least credit, they're playing good hockey. They're working in corners. I think their defense still needs to be figured out. They need to make some additions closer to the trade deadline because I don't think this defense is good enough to win a Stanley Cup. But, you know, their best player this year, their MVP, has been Jack Campbell. He's got three shutouts. He's playing night in, night out, playing good every night. He gives him a chance to win every night. Didn't have to be good last night because the team was really good in front of him. But you're going to have games where the team just is loose defensively and you got to answer the bell. He's had that, and they've rewarded him with good performances. For <coughs> Excuse me. Good performances in front of him. And so – it's a perfect marriage right now in Toronto where Jack Campbell's playing well, the team's playing well in front of him, and it's just a well-oiled machine. And we'll see where it goes. They have New York um, on Thursday. New York won in Montreal last night. They beat Toronto earlier this year in, in overtime, a game they should have lost. Just Durkin went legend, played fantastic, but um, Toronto will be looking for some retribution and uh, in, the, in that game. So that'll be Thursday uh vancouver colorado tonight big game for both teams like i said yesterday vancouver did announce that they're not going to be making any wholesale changes to their to their staff so travis green is safe for now jim benning is not going to be fired but if it continues to get ugly they're going to have to do something because this this team is just not going to be the fans are going to say enough you know they're just not going to have it with this team so we'll see where it goes but um also news from the NHL, last night, uh, Sasha Barkov of the Florida Panthers was injured, um, but he's considered week to week. He's not going to require surgery, so that's good news. He's one of the best players in the NHL, and you know that would be a huge loss for Florida. Not to, it's going to be a loss not to have him, but luckily it's not for a long period of time. Um, so we'll, we'll, see. we'll see what comes, but some good NHL action last night, uh, nonetheless. Um, speaking of Toronto... The baseball team in the city made a move yesterday, uh, re-upping starting pitcher Jose Barrios to a seven-year, $131 million deal, uh, which uh, is $18 million a season, which is just below Hinjin Ryu, who they signed a few years ago to a deal worth $20 million a year. And I think this was a good move. They traded for Barrios with a year left on his deal. And I think they had the hopes that he would resign because they traded Simeon Woods Richardson, a guy that they thought could be a starter or potentially a good bullpen arm. They traded Austin Martin, who was the fifth pick in the draft a few years ago, who's you're likely going to be a third baseman, a, a good prospect. 
And they said, you know what? We'll take the guy that we is proven right now. Uh, Martin could be something. Barrios is a good starting pitcher. He's made all-star teams. And it, seven years is a long period of time, but that's what it takes. You need to give these guys longer contracts. And I credit Toronto for doing this and, and Barrios because, again, there's likely going to be a work stoppage in baseball. December 5th is when the, this season ends, the new one begins technically. And that would mean that the two sides are going to be locked out and players want to have stability. They want to have their contracts. Noah Syndergaard has already signed. You've seen Eduardo Rodriguez. Guys are wanting to get deals done earlier than they normally would because who knows where this is going? Is there a baseball season next year? We don't know. And I credit the Blue Jays continue to be aggressive. Robbie Ray, it shouldn't just be a foregone conclusion that Robbie Ray is departed, you know, uh, but if he is, at least you have the security blanket. You have Alex Manoa. You can hope that Nate Pearson could potentially become a starting pitcher, but you should go and look at other options that are out there. I think Syndergaard actually would have been a good piece for the Jays. I mean, he's a guy that was, is a reclamation project, hasn't pitched since 2019 with Tommy John surgery. But when he's on Thor, you know, my, my namesake, Noah Syndergaard, he can throw 100 miles an hour. He can throw a 93 mile per hour slider. And funny enough, he was drafted by the Toronto Blue Jays and traded for Ari Dickey. But I credit teams that are saying, you know what? <coughs> we got young talent. We got a team that continues to improve. Vladdy got in shape, might win the MVP. Bo Bichette, Marcus Simeon um, got, got nominated for the MVP. He won a gold glove. You know, we have a couple of silver slugger winners. Tiosca Hernandez took a big step. We're, we're just improving all over our team. And what we do need is more pitching. And we need a better bullpen. Well, you keep, you keep your guys and then you look to add where you can. And this, this should just be the launching point. Barrios resigning is obviously important. But for this team now, for, this, for Mark Shapiro, for Ross Atkins, it's seeing free agents and saying, well, it's not that they make too much money. Rodgers makes a ton of cash. Spend that money and try to put the best team on the field and push. Because guess what? The Yankees aren't that formidable. <coughs> Their pitching stinks. The Boston Red Sox had a good run, but they lost Eduardo Rodriguez. That was their best starting pitcher. So they're going to be desperate looking for, for additions as well. So you're in the best position with young prospects, with Manoa, with Barrios, potentially with Robbie Ray to be in a position to win the AL East next year because Tampa Bay, again, they, they're good every year, but I just feel like after a number of good years, they're going to start to hit a slide as well. And this could be the time for the Toronto Blue Jays to have that AL East, you know, locked up and for them to secure it moving forward. So uh, kudos to them. Good show today. I'll be, we'll be back with two podcasts tomorrow uh, around this time tomorrow. I'll be uh, live just by myself. And then tomorrow evening, Ben Murray will join me to talk about week 11 in the NFL season. So look forward to that tomorrow. Uh, enjoy the action tonight. A uh, few NHL games. You got some NBA uh, year in finals and tennis for the men and women been watching a bit of that as well so um but we'll talk about a lot of things tomorrow as always uh enjoy your evenings uh stay healthy stay safe and we'll talk soon